Uh, this is Seymour Rocks reporting from Down Under. Um, I've been moved to make a video just finally putting my thoughts together on this uh, coronavirus or COVID-19. Uh, there are um, contradictory narratives and I'm just trying to make sense of it uh, for myself and uh, hopefully uh, for other people. So I'm going to just share with you uh, the article um, uh, that I wrote. So I'm going to read it. So uh, hopefully it'll get past the, uh, the censor. Um, and uh, yeah, so let's go for it. Okay, so towards making sense of conflicting narratives on coronavirus. I would like after watching this for a couple of months to try and lay out some of the conflicting narratives out there, and where I stand with them, and perhaps make a, a weak attempt to join the dots. It really is a case of mind over matter as I try to get my thoughts together when I would rather be resting. Uh, I've been feeling particularly unwell in the last uh, couple of days, and it really is a by another matter. Anyway, the first question is about the nature and origin of the novel coronavirus. Um, did the coronavirus really come from a fish market? And I answered the question straight away. I wish to say from the outset that the only theory I reject outright is this is a zoonotic virus that came from a fish market in Wuhan. So there we go. I've seen sufficient evidence to persuade me that this theory is false. There are conflicting narratives on this and I've found it difficult to decide uh, which has more credibility. One says that there were patents for the virus and this was spread to Wuhan, China during the military Olympic Games late last year at about the same time as event 201, which was an exercise that more or less described what is happening now. If I was to follow my own ideas about the nature of US imperialism, the deep state, etc., I would opt for this as the proper explanation. It has what I would regard as indirect evidence and fits in terms of motive and opportunity. However, the majority of people outside the mainstream are saying now that this was a bioweapon and came from a P4 bio lab in Wuhan. I came across this idea from various interviews with Dr. Daniel Boyle. Um, who put together US legislation against biowarfare that was dropped after 9-11. Zero Hedge mentioned the laboratory at the end of January and was permanently removed from Twitter uh, the very same day. However, this idea is becoming more popular outside the leftist and mainstream media uh, that will place C uh, Communist Party talking points over an honest discussion of the facts. About a week ago, um, Epoch Times, which is related to the Falun Gong movement, was very supportive of the Trump administration, uh, produced a documentary which is very much like propaganda, but nevertheless contains facts that I have defined from other sources. Uh, just a day or so ago, uh, Stefan Molyneux, for whom I had previously had some grudging admiration for, uh, but has been doing some stellar work on the COVID-19 question, did a video of the case against the Chinese Communist Party, which I found contained a lot of information that was in the Epoch Times documentary, but was far more uh, credible and well argued uh, in my mind. Uh, just today, uh, this video was put out by an uh, American doctor, Paul Bregan, which said more or less the same thing. Um, the one thing that was missing was to factor in any involvement by the deep state in the West. To his credit, Molyneux included in his report what was then very fresh news that America had given th uh, millions of dollars, 30, 30 million, I think, of dollars as a grant to the Wuhan laboratory to investigate a bat virus. The latest news is that the United States has decided to actively investigate the involvement of the Wuhan laboratory. Based on all of this, I've decided to come down on the side that this was an accidental release from the Wuhan laboratory of an extremely dangerous bioengineered virus that contained genetic material from a bat virus, as well as 
from the coronavirus that made it, it more infective and more dangerous than would otherwise be the case. Uh, so it's, it, uh, this means that it's easier to catch uh, and um, it, it, it has an enhanced ability to infect others. Uh, it also came from a project that Bill Gates and the Fauci's and many others were involved in, meaning that these people uh, were complicit in. And this has just come out today, US full-scale investigation into Wuhan. And also this, uh, COVID-19 is a man-made virus. The uh, HIV discoverer says could only have been created in a lab. So now move on to the lockdowns and the Bill Gates vaccination agenda. The other aspect of this, which has been covered up by the media and painted as bad behavior by Trump, uh, is the role of the World Health Organization, um, the WHO in this. People forget very quickly that governments all over the world sat on their hands for many weeks, allowing the virus to spread until the WHO declared a pandemic in March, something that has changed the whole narrative on a dime. Prior to that, we were told it was racist to close borders or stop flights from China. The WHO put a lot of effort into telling the world to stop um, uh, to keep the world flying and to keep the uh, borders open. And then uh, Nancy Pelosi at the time was admonishing people to come on down to Chinatown and people in Italy were hugging people from China. Governments that did take action and the New Zealand government was one was subject to criticism and who knows what threats by the representatives of the Chinese Communist government. After all, the government, after all, the governments fell into line and bought the new party line for the WHO. Trump was the one major world leader who was in denial about the pandemic and has been roundly and correctly condemned for his denial and early inaction. However, as with every 180 degree cha change in party line, the entirety of the media suffers from collective amnesia and forgets the facts and points to the WHO repeating uh, CCTP uh, talking points and criminally allowing the virus to spread around the world. Sorry, I haven't done a very good edit on this. Uh, once the WHO changed its tune and declared a pandemic, things changed very quickly and many governments which had sat on their hands started to announce various degrees of lockdown. Arguably one of the most draconian regulations came out of the New Zealand government and I've been talking about the inequities of the um, bureaucratically mandated rules that look set to destroy much business, especially small business. These faceless bureaucrats appear to have made decisions whereby they have decided which businesses are, will survive, are essential, and those which are not, such as butchers, greengrocers, and the like. At the same time, in other countries, it is seemingly okay for people to crowd together on mass transport, but it is illegal to go for a, a solitary walk with one's dog on the moors. In this country, people are under total lockdown, while as of a week ago, the government had still not shut off entry through airports. Questions are being asked about the economic costs, costs of the shutdown compared to the costs of the virus ripping through the population. I've noticed that the very people who were, have been warning of the dangers of the virus bioweapon People such as Hal Turner, the health ranger, and the team at True News have largely changed their tune and are now talking about the dangers of anti-constitutional and illegal actions of governments in, in imposing draconian lockdowns in areas where the dangers of the virus are too small to justify this. So this is a headline from today from Mike Adams. Uh, a lot of talk which may have given many people cause to uh, to thought, to think, was statements by, from Bill Gates and reflected by others that the 
lockdown should remain in place until a vaccine for COVID-19 has been found. And those who have had the disease and recovered should be issued with an electronic passport, allowing them to participate in economic and other activities. Right now, I'm wondering how this squares with the latest information out today that it is by no means clear that people are developing immunity to the virus, still less herd immunity. So, contrarian arguments. All of this brings me to the other arguments that have led uh, followers to say that this virus is a fraud. In one sense, this is true, in that this is not a virus caused zoonotically, but from bats. But a, um, uh, is bioengineered. I've gone from dismissing such opinions as nonsensical to a recognition that these people are bringing up valid points that have to be taken into consideration if you want to get to the truth. I've been aware of Dr. Shiva Ayudarai, whose videos have been making their way around the internet. However, it was not until last night that I decided to listen to him in the form of a discussion with Stefan Molyneux. The result was that I was given further insights into the whole puzzle. He talked about the nature of science, how open debate is stifled by the atmosphere in academic institutions and scientists, yes, scientists who hold views that go against the ruling dogma are denied funding and access to scientific publications. He also some, had some very opposite comments on the nature of the immune system and pointed out that the orthodox medical, medical fraternity, as well as those who are pushing vaccination, the Gateses and the Fauci's, are coming from an outdated understanding of the immune system, which is far more complex and multifaceted than we're taught. All of this is something that I have understood from the days of my practice in Chinese medicine and talks to medical doctors who seem to have no idea at all of this. Some doctors at the moment are making dangerous claims on social media that it is impossible to do anything to boost the immune system. We are all, according to this, just sitting ducks and all we have to do is lead it to faith, fate or a vaccine that is going to save us all. Uh, so I highly recommend that you watch the video above, but um, I just want to address one particular point. Um, we hear constantly about COVID-19 tests, and I've wondered for a while just what the tests were, and I've asked the question and never got an answer. So it was of special interest to me to hear David Icke talk about this near the beginning of the censored interview with Brian Rose of London Real. I did not totally trust his explanations because I could not find anything to back up his claims until I came across Dr. Ayo Durai's comments above. So I'm just going to play this. First, we don't really know because there is a political and a economic interest to brand everyone as COVID-19. And the WHO created two codes. Remember, the WHO creates the diagnostic codes, which, by the way, they charge for. Very interesting business model they have. So they created two codes for COVID-19, as I understand. They may have created three, but it's definitely two. One was you were actually um, labeled as having COVID-19 through a test. Well, what was that test? It's a PCR test, polymerase chain reaction. Well, what does that mean? That means you're looking for a piece of the nucleotide in your body, and then they magnify it and try to match it to one of the coronavirus nucleotides. By the way, coronavirus is one of the most common, common viruses. We all probably have pieces of it, okay? And they're not even looking for the entire sequence of the COVID-19. It's any corona, actually. And even Kerry Mullis, the people who created PCR, will tell you. Wait, 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 wait. hang on. The COVID-19 test, which is supposed to be testing for SARS-CoV-2, is looking that? for any coronavirus, such it, as it's a new or flu type. or... It's a nucleotide sequence, which doesn't necessarily have to be that, okay? Because I, but furthermore, the PCR tests are highly, highly... Kerry Mullis, who won the Nobel Prize in Medicine, who also supported Duisburg, I mean, uh, in chemistry, 
amazing scientist. Kerry said the PCR test isn't even quantitative. It's qualitative. It's a qualitative test. That's you right. love, okay? It's not quantitative. It's qualitative. It's a guesstimate that's made. That's one code that the WHO has. The second code they had as well is sort of looks like COBID. So when people are coming to these hospitals and they're branding them into one of those two codes, in fact, I was privy to a letter that the CDC sent to hospital administrators, a, a, a very good friend of mine is a pediatrician shared, the letter basically is incentivizing hospital administrators to conflate one and the other. That's what's going on. So Stefan, we don't really know what the numerator is. And I dare ask any one of these people, including Cuomo, to put all of this data in the cloud so I and other professionals can review it. And you don't have to put the names, you can follow HIPAA guidelines give the pre-existing conditions of these people. We had just a very close friend of ours who was a big smoker, friend of, friend of ours' husband, big smoker, always would get pneumonia, had multiple incidents uh, of going to the hospital and getting intubated. Well, he was just COBID-19. Let's say, God forbid, something happens to him. What are they gonna brand him as, COBID-19 death? Well, forget the fact that he ate horribly, was you know, 40, 50 pounds overweight, was a smoker. That'll be forgotten. So. That's what people need to understand. We have created, remember, because of big hospitals, because of the big academia, because of big pharma, these three people have colluded in a beautiful way to create this fear mongering. And if they well, and, uh, sorry, but the hospitals. Are okay, so um, let's just go on from there. So the essence of what he was saying is that the testing we're hearing about is not an antibody test against the actual virus or what is called an RT-PCR test, which I understand is qualitative, not a quantitative test. It picks up material from coronavirus that conceivably already be in our bodies. What I took take from all this is that there are questions which need to be asked and that top-down explanations from science orthodoxy are not to be taken at face value. This does not imply in any way that this novel coronavirus is a fraud in my mind, uh, but that the whole narrative, which is a complete inversion of the previous one that they were, um, uh, you know, prior to uh, March, uh, needs to be open to question. In the meantime, various people have asked if I'm going to have a flu vaccine. To those people, my answer is definitive and simple over my dead body. Okay, so we're in very, very early days because I suspect that this uh, virus is going to be around and with us uh, for a long time, uh, well beyond um, uh, you know, this, this season and how it mutates uh, and what's going to happen in the future, whether there's going to be a second or a third wave and what that uh, is going to bring is anybody's guess. Um, so that's my uh, tentative offering. Uh, I don't regard it as uh, definitive. Uh, I welcome uh, constructive criticism. Anything that's not constructive, of course, I won't accept. And I'd be more than happy if people have got extra information that they can uh, bring to the table. Uh, so that's me. That's uh, Seymour Rocks reporting from Down Under.